Amen. For the benefit of those who are joining us and those who have not been around since last Sunday, we started looking at the subject of reprogramming your heart or your life for kingdom breakthroughs. I would say kingdom breakthroughs. Kingdom breakthroughs. And we need to understand that if we do not reprogram, the old program takes over. Now you might think, well, maybe they're just saying that because they're preachers. No, even preachers who came out of something, after they had gone on in the Lord, some of them fell back into what they came out of. Do you see what I'm saying? That's how strong that programming is. It's not a joke at all. So this is not a matter of, that was a good message. Amen, somebody. I'm saying even preachers, after they had preached for years, in their relaxed moments, in their unguarded moments, something triggered off what was there before and they fell right back into what they came out of. These things ought not to be so. Can I hear loud amen? amen. These things ought not to, ought to be so. So in the first uh, message, we looked at your habits and attitudes and things like that and we said that you are being programmed, you have been programmed, not that you are being programmed, you have been programmed because psychologists have found out that when you are relaxing, enjoying the beats, the lyrics are settling in. Should I say that one more time? I said when you are relaxing, enjoying what? The beats. The, beats. the lyrics are what? Because your mind can't tell the difference. And it's known that it's the most relaxed time that things enter. So, so that's what goes on. You have been, you've been programmed. There are certain values that have been sent into your system, whether you know it or not. Certain ways of life have been programmed into you. And if you don't know how to reprogram for kingdom breakthroughs, when the thing hits, the contradiction hits, you wonder, why did I do what I just did? How many of you know that some people do things and they wonder later, did I just do that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, somebody else programmed you. You did what you were programmed to do. And now you are seeing the consequence of it. But thank God that there's reprogramming. Say amen. You say, but how do you know there's reprogramming? If you look at Colossians chapter 3, you will see what I mean by reprogramming. It says, if ye then, from verse 1, if, ye, if then ye were raised with Christ, seek those things which are what? Above, where Christ is, sitting on the right hand of God. Religion tells you that means don't do anything. Just think about, you know, angels clapping their hands and singing. <laughs> That's not what it says here. Now, verse 2 says, set your minds on things what? Things what? Above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, I would say therefore, put to death your, your, your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you was yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, now, does anybody just get angry for getting angry? Talk to me. So why did we say put off anger? That means that if something causes you to be angry externally, you have an internal control to regulate how you express that anger. If that were not true, then this instruction is baseless. Am I talking? I'm just going back through a few things we said. So if you didn't get it, get the CDs and all that. Since put to all this anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, feel the language out of your mouth. What? You have a choice. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. And have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, free, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. Ever say tender mercies kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also must, you also must do. 
But above all these things, put on what? Love, which is the bond of perfection. Now, Satan is defined love to mean feeling. No, this love is agape. This, is, this one appeals to the will, not to the feelings. Say amen. And let the peace of God rule in your heart to which you also were called in one body. And be, faith, be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, what? In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Amen. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That puts sin out of it. You cannot sin in the name of the Lord. Say amen. Say, Lord, I'm giving you thanks as I'm telling this lie. <laughs> it doesn't quite fit. So for you to know that there's a reprogramming, these things are there. Now, in Joshua 1, 8, like we read, this book of the Lord shall not depart, quote it with me, out of your mouth, but you will meditate therein. That thou mayest observe to according to all that is written, then you will make your way and you will have. Can these people put it up on the screen so those who don't know it can see it? Joshua 1 8, put it on the screen for us. Read it one more time. This book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth, but I shall meditate on it day and night that I may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then I shall make my way, and I will have whose responsibility is it to make your way prosperous. But it's giving you the key, your mind, your mouth, your action. And so if you look at Psalm 1 as well, it says, bless the man, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, but sits, nor, nor sits in the seat of the sinners, or stand in the way of whatever is come full. Uh, and he says, but his delight is in the law of his Lord. In it does he meditate what? Did you notice that Joshua 1, 8 and Psalm 1 is saying day and night. That means there's no room for something else. Day and? In other words, you should take over your priority. Why? It is reprogramming. It is reprogramming. The last scripture we read before we go on to today is 3 John 2. 3 John 2. Put it up for us, please. Beloved, I pray that you may what? Prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Verse 3 gives us the clue. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you just as you walk in the truth. Can I hear an amen? amen? So there is a place for truth to be in me and there is a walking in the truth. Say amen. And the second time we were looking at it, I looked, let me, look at, let me just tell you all the points. The first point was your attitude. Amen. How many of you know your attitude goes ahead of you? Your attitude is a function of how you feel and how you think. So whenever you show up somewhere, you have an attitude already that's registered your presence before you showed up. Hello, <laughs> you better, let's leave that alone. But the attitude you should have is that of a winner. Say amen. We play until I win. That commitment will inform your willingness to change, to grow, to improve. You are a winner and not a loser. Can you say with me, I'm a winner and not a loser? Immediately you say such things, your mind catches, you know, Olympic winners and, you know, are you going to be a superstar, are you going to be a celebrity. That's not what he says. He just says you are a winner. Say, man, you can win in the less, less things, the smallest thing, you can still be a winner. Don't let the enemy tell you, you're not cut out for stardom, you're not cut out for celebrity status, so you just keep quiet, it's not you they're talking about. No, you are a winner. And that's where to, you see, these this things won't happen just because you heard a sermon. You're going to internalize these things and tell yourself, you know what, I'm a winner. Amen. You know, if nobody celebrates you, you're still a winner. If nobody recognizes it, you're still a winner. You're not a winner because you want somebody to clap for you. You're a winner because there's God in heaven who is marking your register. And you're telling him the sacrifice of your son is not going to be in vain. I'm going to be a winner. You know, it's better to fight and go to heaven fighting than beg the issue. Do you catch the attitude? You see what I call attitude there now? You must have the attitude of, I'm going to stand until I win. This is why a lot of people's faith don't work. Because they, they try it. 
and then the stuff say, right, that thing didn't work. No, you don't try faith, you live by faith. And you stick at it. This thing's gonna have to work, man. Why? Because God said it. <laughs> That's the attitude of wins. You know, when we were learning faith in those early days, I think it was Kenneth Hagin, he said, when you are ready to stand forever, you won't stand for too long. <laughs> it captures something of your attitude right there. You are ready to say, you know what, God says it and I believe it. You are staying there. You know, it's like, I'm not going to back off because I'm a winner. Say, man, yeah. Satan knows you're a winner, then he backs up. But if he can push you back, he'll push you back. Amen. So, we also said, number two, understand the tools, the tools, the, your tools, how God operates. In Matthew 6, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his what? Righteousness and every other thing shall be what? Added unto you. God knows what you need or have need of before he says you should ask. He still wants you to ask. But what we're looking at here is this. How does God operate? How many of you not like to know how God operates? You know, a lot of people say, I want God to do a miracle for me. Is that not true? This is how it works. Depending on your orientation, your foundation, you know, when you pray, God answers. That's true. But I'm here to tell you, God operates by his word. Did you hear that? I said God operates by what? You know, even when he wanted to create the earth in Genesis, when he wanted to create the, this present whatever in Genesis, it said, let there be what? Did you notice he said it before his power made it become a reality? That's how he operates. Did you catch that? So it's not enough to say, God knows what I have need of. And I've asked him. When you're still a baby Christian, that's fair enough. But you need to find out, if God were to come into your situation and change it, what would he first do? Should I tell you? He will sow the seed of his word. Amen. If you check all through the Bible, anytime they have a problem... And they cry out to God. God takes the pains to make sure people understand what he considers before he releases his power. Did you catch that? Children of Israel will cry out to God, oh God, oh God. The Bible will say, and God remembered his covenant with his Abraham. Is that not true? What was his covenant with Abraham? He gave Abraham his words and he needs his word for him to work. Either half an ear, because it's, that was point number two. The sower sows the word. The sower sows the word. What is the word? The seed. Put the seed in the ground. Say amen. How many of you would like to see a husband and wife, they don't consume their marriage and they are believing God for a baby? Does it make sense? No consummation. No coming together and say, Lord, we're just praying for us to have it. We want to have virgin birth. Will they have another virgin birth? Talk to me. No. It won't happen. Since there's from <laughs> seed time and harvest. Genesis 8.22 actually says, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. That's a principle you must take home with you. There's a moment, there must be a seed on the ground. So, but what does that mean? It means that in my walk with God, God will plant a seed. My study of the word, the word will be alive. Something must be planted in my heart. There must be an operational, if you like, an operational system. The software, the word of God must enter my heart for it to begin to position me correctly in the spirit for the things God wants to do to happen in my life. You read stories like, listen, the woman with the issue of blood. It says, she heard. Is that not true? That means something was communicated to her that this man can heal. So faith coming by what? Yeah. And hearing by? So when she was pressing through the crowd to touch the hem of his garment, did she have resistance in pressing through the crowd? Talk to me, somebody. For the Bible to say she pressed through, that means that her faith was at work and Jesus not even knew anybody was coming through. He was just walking through the crowd and they were all around him. But she pressed through until she made contact. And Jesus then said, whoa, the power of God healed you. Is that what he said? He says, woman, your faith has healed you. So how did she have the faith? She heard. See, man, she did what? 
she heard. Do you think she just heard, is that what she heard? <laughs> she just heard, woo -woo 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 -woo. is that what she heard? No, she heard something specific. Don't you think so? And in hearing, something entered her heart that if he can do it for somebody else, he can do it for me. Now, she didn't wait to say, Jesus, son of David, like blind Bartimaeus did. That one screamed his head out. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus was walking by. They said, keep quiet, the master is passing. He said, you don't understand. I have heard that this man can heal. Jesus, he screamed the more. And Jesus stopped. Watch. Jesus would have said, oh, I know he's blind. Let me just heal him. Is that what Jesus did? No. He said, bring him to me. The man came. Fancy a blind man coming like that. I'm putting some theater to this now. <laughs> and he comes to you. Yeah, Jesus is before you now. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do? Duh. <laughs> Don't you see? Is that, can you get my point? What would you want me to do? Heal this pimple. There's this pimple that has been bothering me on my forehead. Lord, please heal it. Is that what he said? No. That I may what? Why did Jesus expect him to say that when he saw he was blind? I'm trying to help you understand how God works. Say amen. It's not enough to say, God knows my needs. It's not enough. Now, when you get born again in the midst of corporate faith and you are a new believer and you come in the midst of church people and all of them are praying and interceding for church members, things do happen for you without your faith. Am I making sense? But the time comes when God expects you not to only have faith for yourself, but faith for other people too. We're going to get into that. So you now get how God works. It doesn't mean if you don't have the word, then God will do nothing. That's why we are in a corporate situation. There are things that your prayers have helped another person get results. Do you get the point? That's the secret of crusades, big meetings. Before a Reinhard Bonke goes to any nation, six months before then, churches have gathered together to pray and to fast weekly, monthly, daily. They have generated the power of God. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man Amplified says is, it makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. That means that those people have released their faith. They've put prayer and power out there. They've had the word in them, so they are praying. And so a blind man comes to that crusade, and Reinhard Bonke says, In the name of Jesus, let all the blind see. And you say, wow, that was the power of God. Just like that. No, it wasn't just like that. Some people paid the price for that to happen. Am I making sense? That's why the enemy has discomfited the church in this part of the world where everybody's just doing their own thing. And you wonder where the power went. Hello? Ain't no power without unity. But we'll get there. So number three. When things go consistently bad, you need deliverance. And I brought it out by the grace of God that in John 8, 32, there is the making free and the setting free. Everybody say make free. free. Set free. Set. Is there a difference? Yes. The making free is when the word of God comes into me to replace what was in me, I am made free. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed and you will know the truth and the truth not set free will make you free ever say process the making of freedom is a process that truth comes into me and begins to deal with things in my life until i am made free that's why i said if you continue amen but there's another setting free it's called the power encounter when now you come in contact with the power of God and bam, you are set free. Say amen. Being set free and being made free are two important aspects that should go together. Am I making sense? You can be set free. The power of the Bible says in Romans 8, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. 
Say amen. Whereas one is an instance, the other is a process. Take note of that in deliverance. So I'm teaching you things so that you don't think, I don't have anybody to pray for me. Now you know what to do. Did you hear me? Oh, I don't have anybody to come and do deliverance for me. Some people go from place to place looking for deliverance. Listen, listen, if you know the truth, you can walk in deliverance. Somebody said, I have strong, you know, you know it's, it's a desire in me. It just keeps coming back. Desire for loss, for sin, for alcohol, for women. It just keeps coming back. Is it something, you know, I need help for the thing to stop. No, I said you need truth for you to decide to stop. Do you know what you should do if you have that kind of problem? Hate it. Hate what you enjoy in the flesh. Don't just say, I don't know why it keeps coming back. And you know what? Let me tell you the secret of how I told you the first day. How does how do evil spirits work? They don't come by Gaspar the friendly ghost. Ooh. So there's a spirit here, there's a spirit. No, 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 no. No, no, no. That's how they told you lies. They come and affect your thoughts. A spirit comes in now and says, you are no good. You say, where did that thought come from? From hell. But instead of you knowing that because you don't know the Bible, you say, I know I'm no good, but I know Jesus died for me anyway. You know. So you yield to the thought. So now that you know you're no good, you know the next interview you go for, they probably won't recognize that you're good enough. Well, I hope not because I've been praying that God will, you know, do something about my, I'm giving you a case study here. Well, you know, you're going to suffer so much. You're going to be in lack. You're going to be in want. God did not say he will supply your want. He said he will supply your need. Religious lies. My, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not don't say my God supplies my need alone. He also supplies my wants. Say amen. Yeah. Isn't what I'm saying here? Those thoughts will come to you and you accept them, accommodate them. Programming is going on. Programming is going on. Then when you show up, sorry you. You look like a sorry sight. And you wonder why nothing good is happening. So, but I prayed about it. Don't you understand? He works with his word. Are you getting the gist now? Okay, the word is enough for the wise. Number three or number four, whatever, practices that will build you up. Aha, uh-huh. I said something about uh, deliverance. I said, Jesus said, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. <laughs> in other words, when you operate in the word, and it looks like that desire, that loss, or that thought, or whatever, is not going. Add some days of prayer and fasting to it. Jesus said this kind. I don't know why he said that, but it looks like some kinds of devils don't respond until some things are done until they check them out. Am I talking here? This kind go ahead not out by prayer and fasting, but he himself didn't go and fast again because he has already been fasted up before he started his ministry. So he just said, you devil, get out. Because the man came and said, I don't know why your disciples could not cast this devil out. And Jesus looked at them and said, oh, you faithful generation. He said, bring the boy to me. He did the deed job. And then he turned to his disciples. The disciples says, Master, why could we not cast out that devil? Jesus didn't say, because I'm around. He's always said, this kind, go ahead not out. So if you're having any problems, you declare some days of fasting. Say amen. Do personal deliverance. This use you spirit of whatever your name is. You have no control over my life. Spirit of lack, spirit of failure, spirit of anything, whatever your name is, I don't care. The Bible says Jesus has been given a name above every name. So if you have a name, you will bow. And if you don't know his name, give it one. (laughs) Say amen. Right, so practices that will help you. Develop a word orientation of study, meditation, and confession. That must be developed. It's not enough. It's not enough to be a good Christian. You must know the Bible. Say amen. And I'm not saying theology here. I'm saying know the Bible. There's a difference between just going on a theological, eschatological journey of, you know, the Bible says, ooh, ooh, ooh. You know, some time ago, I, I listened to one man of God. How many of you have heard of Egyptian writing, hieroglyphics? Is that what they call it? Is it hero or hero? Hieroglyphics. You know, when you look at Egyptian writing, 
What do you see? You see paintings, drawings. Is that not true? Now, the people who used that kind of writing in, those early t- in the ancient times, they were not trying to display their artistic qualities. They were trying to communicate something. Is that not true? So fancy you and I going to one of those places now and looking and saying, wow, look at how fine this person's face is. Wow, look at how many servants he has around him. If that guy could wake from the dead, he will slap you on the face. I didn't paint that so that you can see that. There's a message there you need to get. That's the kind of thing I see many times when people read the Bible. They don't get the message. You know what they get? How many years did Methuselah leave? What's my business with that? Was the Garden of Eden on earth or in heaven? Did the devil truly come as a snake or a serpent? Or I'm like, okay. When Jesus encountered Satan and the Mount of Temptation, did he come like a man, like an angel? What is the relevance of what you're asking me? You know why? They want to know the Bible to have an argument. To discuss their knowledge of the Bible. You know, um, in theological terms, we call that so and so. (laughs) Sorry. I want to leave the Bible. I want to leave the reality of what I read in the Bible. I'm not interested in your eschatological journeys. Let's come with me to, and then we go, and when we leave the place, wow, the guy has so much knowledge of the Bible. How will that put food on my table? How would that get the level off my case? Say, no. The church must be eschatologically balanced and theologically settled. Go to the seminary or the cemetery, wherever. <laughs> Whatever they do there. So develop an orientation of study. Ever say study. You, see, you cannot study something you don't read, so start reading. You can choose to study a subject, choose to study a character, anything. Just have an orientation. I'm going to study. You don't have to study the whole thing in one day. Say, I'm studying, I'm studying. No. Study. Make it a habit. Study the Bible. Say amen. Then meditate on the things that strike a chord in your heart. When you read through the Bible, bam. That's what we call medit- uh, uh, um, devotional study. What you should do every day. We call it quiet time. And that's what we call normal study. Just you know, as a pastime, cut down on this time, cut down on some other time, and just read the Bible. That's why CDs help you, because they stimulate your thoughts. Is that not true? You can say, the pastor's been talking about whoever, maybe David or Daniel. I want to read the book of Daniel. I want to, don't just read the whole book. Read two, three chapters, then think about what you've read. Say amen. amen. Then you see thoughts there that can make you meditate. That's how it works. And then you begin to speak what God says about you. Say amen. Make a study of it. You know, what I'm, saying, what I'm emphasizing this, a lot of people don't have that orientation. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. A lot of people don't have that orientation. You know, when you got born again, everybody was prophesying over you. God says the Lord, you will raise the dead. And then you go around saying, I will raise the dead. And no dead is raised. Why? Because what they saw may be true for your future, but what you need to do between that, that time and when that future happens, nobody told you. And I don't blame them. Let me tell you one thing where the prophetic can be confusing. You see, the prophetic people see the end. They don't see the process that leads to the end. When Joseph had the dream, he saw himself standing, everybody bowing to him. He was prophetically right. But did he see the prison there? Did he see slavery there? That's the problem with the prophetic. The prophetic stands up and God enables them to see the end. But we who are Master builders. We're going to dig the hole here now and put the foundation. This rock has to go. That's the work that is not being done. The prophetic says, you are a mighty man of God. And you say, yes, sir. I'm a mighty man of God. And you know, I speak to mountains and they move. Hallelujah. 
But nobody tells you that, oh boy. Um, there is a lifestyle that leads to that. Yeah. Am I talking here? So if you come into a prophetic environment, everybody's head is tall and high. The shoulders are, wings are flying in their shoulders, called pride, you know. I would say, I'm, I'm going to raise the dead. God just, I have a good feeling about what the Lord just said to me. I've seen that many times. They're still where they were years after. You know why? Orientation, zero. Mm -hmm. I'm glad some of you came to church today. Especially you. <laughs> Amen. Develop it. Develop a prayer life. Don't wait until crisis hits. Start praying. Intercede for people to be saved. Supplicate for Christians to come to the knowledge of the truth. Supplicate. Just make a habit of prayer. Say, this is my time of prayer. Every 30 minutes or one hour a day, dedicated to God in prayer. This is my hour. Say, God, I don't even know what to pray about. Shandelamo Shatahaya. Just pray in tongues. If you don't know how to pray in tongues, at the end of this service, come out here. We'll lay hands on you. Get filled Holy Ghost. Say amen. But the point I'm making is make a habit of prayer. Number f another point there, have a regular fellowship with other believers. We're going to talk about that today. Develop soul winning. Now, let me say this about soul winning. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, let's go there quickly. We have a ministry of reconciliation. How many of you know you have a ministry? Every one of us got that ministry. Don't think, I'm not cut out for this. Nobody asks you to be cut out. Just do it. Say amen. <laughs> amen, somebody. Now watch, it says, um, where did I see that now? Has given us, that's it, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 5, from verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creature, new creation, all things have what? Passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Which all things? All things that are in the new creation have become new. Now, all things have God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given to us what? The ministry of reconciliation. Was he talking to, about himself alone or the entire church? He's talking about all of us. Don't your neighbor and say, I have a ministry. Have a ministry. It's a ministry of reconciliation. reconciliation. But you see, let me show you how good this is. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling who? The world, the world to himself. Now watch. And not doing what? Imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us what? Do you know what that means? That God presently is not mad at anybody. But they don't know it. God is not mad at anybody. But they don't know it. So would you please tell them? Say amen. Do you catch what I'm saying here? You have a ministry. God has already done something. Now, you say, but if God has already done it, why don't he just save them? No. God has solved the sin problem. You and I need to solve the sinner problem. Do you catch that? God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. They don't know that. Somebody needs to tell them and they need to believe that so that what he has done in Christ can become an experiential reality for them. So that's why you don't have to carry any load on your neck. Just know that you have a ministry of reconciliation. Say amen. Join two people together who didn't know that it's like if you want to settle a quarrel between me and Marco right now and you've heard my view I have none against Marco Marco thinks I have everything against him and you go in between and say Marco Pastor Kola has nothing against you he said do you really believe that see the way he called my name when he was preaching see the way he was referring to me when he was preaching I think he has something against me no, 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 uh, Marco. I, I just finished discussing with him now. He, that's the way he is, you know. Now, you know, that's the way his own style is. He said, Oh, really? You know what you're doing? You are reconciling Marco and I. Because Marco thinks there's something in my heart against him. I know there's nothing in my heart, but you are the reconciliation minister. Do you catch it? So when you meet people, they don't know God is not mad at them. Amen. But having said that, when they repent of their sins and receive Jesus, God now expects them not to live in sin the way they were before. Can you catch the point? So how many of you will embrace the ministry of reconciliation? Amen. Let me give you another side to that. Did you notice that when Jesus was to talk about the harvest, he didn't say, oh God. No, he didn't ask us to pray that people should be saved. You know what he asked us to do? He said, ask the Lord of the harvest to send forth what? Laborers into the harvest field. 
In other words, he didn't say he should be praying, God, save them. He has already done what he can do. Somebody else needs to do what they should do so that what he has done can be a, a reality. Am I making sense? So if you sit down here and say, God, save the world, God, save the world, you could be say, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. You're not doing anything. Hello? It's like praying for somebody. Oh, God, bless Pastor Kola. You are not doing anything. That's not prayer. You're just making your conscience feel good that you have done a religious activity. Say amen. Say, oh, God, bless them in harvest time. Bless them, bless them. They are already blessed. Get real. Lord, grant them the spirit of wisdom and revelation, knowledge of you, the eyes of their understanding, being like, ah, now you are praying. Amen, somebody. Oh, God, bless Come on. If you must be educated enough to stop all this generalized bless. Okay, you got the message. Okay, now. So, develop regular fellowship. Develop soul winning. The last point I made there was stay hungry. I would say stay hungry. How do you stay hungry? I stay hungry. Say, man. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs for it. Let me tell you straight away. If you're born again, you are hungry. You know what happens to you like a child who goes to eat candy and he doesn't like mommy's vegetable. You have fed your hunger on junk so you don't appreciate good food. So you're already hungry. So stop feeding junk on junk so you can stay hungry for God. Say amen. That's the reason why. Have you noticed why people want entertainment? They want this, they want... There's a hunger. Somebody put it this way. I think one of these old-timers. He said, there's a God-shaped vacuum in everyone that human beings are using every other thing to feel but God. Yes, that's why human beings don't rest. They're either creating more sinful habits, more sinful ideas, more sinful things. Why? There's a hunger in everybody. The hunger is in you as well. When Christ came into you, there is, when he says, out of your, um, um, when Jesus said, in that believes in me, out of his belly shall, no, 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 flow. The one he talked about, John chapter 4, wells of salvation. There's a well in you, now you know how to feel that hunger with the Holy Ghost and with the word of God. Say amen. So stay hungry. Today, the two points we are looking at, and they are long points. Number one, develop healthy relationships with others who have a word orientation. And number two, develop a lifestyle of obedience to the word of God. Let's turn to our Bibles to Acts chapter 4. What did I call this point? Develop healthy relationships with other word, other, others with a word orientation. Not the believers generally. De- then develop a life of obedience, a lifestyle of obedience to the word. Okay, so... Acts 4.23, I like it, and it says, Being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they had heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are, you are God, who made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why do the heathens rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look to their threats and grant to your servants that with all what? Boldness. They must speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus Christ. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was what? shaking and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with what? Boldness. I want you to see something there that when they got the persecution from verse 13 I think it is when they were preaching about Jesus then the people the the leaders of their time were against them. They saw the miracle that was happening and they said no you guys should stop preaching in this name and Peter was saying, whether it is right in your sight of, in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, for we cannot but speak the things we know of and all of that. So when they had threatened them, I want you to catch the picture of what I'm saying here. They came against the authorities, the political leadership they were under was against their preaching of the gospel. And when they had threatened them and they let them go, 
The Bible says they went to their own companions. Everybody say, my own companions. I want you to know that it is very vital for you to have a company. And when I say company, I don't mean a limited liability company. (laughs) I mean companions. That's the reason why God has established local churches, to have company. Like-minded believers who are making progress in their personal work with God. If you want to know one of the things Satan has done so well is to cause division amongst churches. Look at what happened here. Can you imagine if they met you and all you could say was, Peter, I think you're getting too big for your boots. Why would you be speaking and let the people in authority have something against you? Will that be truly Peter's company? Talk to me. It won't be truly Peter's company because that will dampen his faith. Am I talking here? And listen, church, everybody's got his own company. That's why we went from step one to this. If you are a general Christian, anything goes, you have your own company. The ones that will say, qui sera sera, what will be, will be. We don't know why the Lord has brought opposition to us. Since the Lord has chosen it fit to bring opposition, Maybe the Lord has something else to do that we don't know. So he says we should live at peace with all men. So let us all be quiet and live at peace. Everybody say amen. Amen. (laughs) Do you catch my point? The point is if you are like that, you will have your own company. Talk to me, somebody. Do you catch what I'm saying? Now, let me show you the scriptural basis for this. It's so important you get this because it is very vital. The reason why many people are not effective is because they don't know how to connect to their own company. And if they have their own company, Satan makes sure there is strife in their own company. Listen, guys. Whenever you think about others in your company and they think about you, they shouldn't be thinking about your faults. This is why it's difficult to have company. You know, when you think about someone, you say, ah, that person will be thinking about my fault. Would you feel free to tell the person the dealings of God in your heart? No. That's why we shouldn't be fault finders. Hello, somebody. Is there anybody here who doesn't have fault? How many of you would like for, why don't you do the same fault finding ministry you have on yourself? (laughs) And all that you think about yourself is your fault. This is the problem in the church. When we think about church, we should think about people who love God, love us enough to overlook some of those faults so that the good in us can come out. But when you have fault finders, every small thing you do, when you have any dealing in God, you want to go and say anything and say, hallelujah, God bless you. But let me show you why this is so important. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Let's, let's do some Bible study here. Amen? In Ephesians 4, it talks about what every joint supplies. There's no way you're going to supply anything if you're going to be criticizing me. Let's watch. Verse 16. Let's take it from verse 14. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of man in the, con- in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, the sp- but speaking the truth in what? Now, that's where it looks like criticism sometimes. You speak the truth in love. So it's not enough to speak the truth. Speak it in. Speaking the truth in love because you are speaking the truth of the mind of building. May grow up into, in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what's what? Every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, I want you to catch a few things there. Every joint supplies according to effective working. That working there in some old translation is what does anybody with an old King James, what does it say? Old King James. Compacting as a freight. Nobody with old King James here. All of you are too modern. <laughs> old King James, please. I'm going to wait. Yes, you're going to get it. 
for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted. Everybody say compacted. By that which every joint supplied. Now, that word compacting is the joining together without schism. In the New Testament, the book of Acts, it says in one accord. There is a pulling together that is like a compacting. It says by every, that from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Now watch. You and somebody else make a joint. <laughs> Say amen. And then it says, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, that is a loaded statement. If you're going to piece this, there is a joining together. There is a supply of the Spirit. There are things that you can bring to the body of Christ that is meant to be your own contribution. Can I hear an amen? amen. Let me give you another scripture before I expand on it. Philippians 1. Let's go to Philippians 1. Philippians 1. To show you that even Apostle Paul needed the supply of the Spirit. Philippians 1. Look at verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my what? Deliverance through your prayer and what? The supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Watch. If you look at Ephesians, it says every joint supplies. Is that not true? The secret of increase is as if everybody is bringing his own contribution. The body increases. It increases in influence, increases in power, it increases in dynamism, it increases in love, it increases in grace. Everything God has in store is meant to increase when every joint is supplying and everybody's doing his own part. Do you catch that? Paul himself said, Your prayer and what? Say it with me supply of the Spirit. That is too low now. Supply of the Spirit. Now, what that tells me is this, that God's method for bringing increase in his body on earth is when every joint is supplying and everybody's doing his part. Now, that's what you saw in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, when, they were, when being let go, they went to their own company. What do you think the company did? They brought a supply of the spirit. They brought a prayer. Now, you can't do supply of the spirit if you're not a praying person. Out of your belly shall flow. You get the gist now. So you must be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be a praying person, then you can supply. Say, I'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. I'll be a praying person. Then I can supply. That's the reason why when no supply is taking place, it looks as if God cannot do anything. And people say, why is God not moving? No, there is a place. The Holy Ghost dwells somewhere. It's called inside the believer. Out of your belly shall flow what? If your mouth keeps quiet, there is no... Am I talking? So that's the problem. Somebody says, why is God not moving supernaturally? Because there is no supply of the... Oh, come on. Say it. Supply of the... You see what I'm saying? So all the devil needs to do is to keep you offended at somebody. Supply of the spirit. So somebody has a problem there. Why is God letting that problem happen? Supply your own part. Say amen. Now, watch the prayer that they prayed there. They said, grant. Now, I like the way they prayed there. I like it. Did you notice they didn't say, oh God. Help us so that we don't fall into the bad books of the men in authority. Is that what they prayed? They didn't even pray about their problems first. They said, oh God. Everybody said, worship. worship. <laughs> you are God. <laughs> and they didn't just say, oh God, meet our needs. Give me money. Give me money. Oh, give me something. Give me anything. Just give me. <laughs> no, that's not what they did. They said, oh God. They didn't say, oh need. Oh God. Am I making sense here? Listen, guys, you must be filled with the Spirit, learn to pray, and then supply. This is why Satan has blinded the church. A work needs to be done in an area. And the church expects a superstar to come and do it. Ain't no superstars. Apostle Paul said, through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit. That means that when you were praying, the Holy Ghost used your prayer 
to supply the spirit of whatever it is I needed, the grace, the strength, the breakthrough. I just told you about Reinhard Bonke. That means that those miracles are supplying the spirit of God to the gifting of Reinhard Bonke so that miracles were taking place. Am I making sense? If you were Satan and you knew this, just discomfit all of them. Make them pick quarrels with one another. And then they won't come to the church without... Eh. And then it looks like nothing happened. Meanwhile, individually, they have needs. And people can supply the spirit for their other person's need. That's why the Bible says every joint supplies, everyone contributes, increase comes. Are you getting the point? The apostles, when they went to their own company, it took the supply of the spirit of the other guys to give them the boldness to continue to preach the word. And in chapter 5, the miracles they asked for began to happen. Now you can understand why when Peter was in prison, the Bible says they prayed without season. What if they kept quiet? Peter would be killed. Is it God's will? No. Am I making sense here? So when I say, please identify, it's so much more than this. Do you even know that even your understanding of the word is going to be influenced by what somebody else understands? In Ephesians 3, when Paul was praying, he said that you may be able to comprehend together with all the saints what is the length, the breadth, the depth, and the height of the love of God which passes understanding. In other words, there's something you will see that when you say it, I will be seeing it for the first time. Wow! I didn't see that! My God! You know what has happened? You have brought a dimension of God to my awareness that I may comprehend together with what? All the saints. So it's not only supply of the spirit, but even your comprehension of God's will, God's purpose for your life. Why is it that people like Paul, when they came to Antioch, and then the Lord spoke to them that they should go on in an apostolic assignment, why did they need to be prayed for by the elders of Antioch? They were the ones ministering to them, but they needed to be prayed for and be separated to what they were called for. They needed the supply of the spirit. Am I making sense? So you see how we need one another now. So if nobody's making progress, somebody's not supplying to. I hope you're getting something out of this. It says in Hebrews 10 that we should not forsake the assembly together of one another. Now, if you are nobody, you will have a company of nobodies. So that's why I didn't put this as point number one. I want you to be on a program of reprogramming. So when you have your own company, you'll be effective in that company. Say amen. See what I'm saying here? You must have your company. Daniel had his company. Esther had her company. Say amen. Everybody has a company. Guess who determines what is in that company? By your own lifestyle. You attract your kind to yourself. If you're a gossip, you attract a lot of busybodies to yourself. Did you hear this? Did you hear this? You attract those who want to hear that. If you're a praying person, you attract praying people to yourself. But whatever you do, attract the right people to yourself so that it can be the supply of the Spirit. Now, the last point develop a lifestyle of what? Obedience to the Word, to the principles that govern. The principles that govern your life must be the principles based on the Word of God. Amen. And I have seven different points here. Should I start? Yes. Principle number one, thanksgiving and praise. I'll tell you what I found out in this one. There was a man that was prayed for. He had an incurable disease. He, they, were, they prayed for him all over. So one day he was left alone to die. So he went to his cottage somewhere in the woods in America. And he looked at the woods and he said, it's better for me to die in the woods than to die in the house. So he walked out to the woods and he thought, I've been prayed for. It hasn't worked. Then the idea occurred to him. Let him start thanking God for his healing. No, the idea didn't occur. God showed him a vision. God showed him that your prayers have gone so high 
but your thanksgiving is so low. So like, can you increase your thanksgiving to be as high as your prayer? <laughs> I learned something from that. So he began to thank God for his healing. Did you hear me? He began to thank God for his healing. To increase the thanksgiving to be as high as the prayer. <laughs> and he thanked God to the point where it was out of the scream because strength came back to him. A man that was supposed to die, he began... Almost the enemy told him, you will die here and nobody will notice you. You will be rotten before they notice your hair. He just went ahead and thanked God for his healing. He thanked God so much that strength came back. He got so healed, it was the screaming of thanksgiving that made people know that he was there. That guy got completely healed. Amen. Lesson, when we have prayed, it's time to give him thanks. Amen. You know what I started doing after I saw that? I started thanking God. <laughs> I also want my thanksgiving to be as high as my prayer. Amen. So whatever you've been praying about, start thanking. Amen. Say it loud, amen. amen. So when I say obey the principles of God's word, I'm saying thanksgiving praise out of a thankful heart should be one of the principles that govern your heart. My wife said it in one of her messages, you cannot be thankful and prideful at the same time. So be thankful. And when we say thankful, don't just say thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Give him thanks for specific things you've prayed about. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my, you know what I'm saying? Thank you for restoration of peace in my home. Amen. Thank you for my children. Thank you. Point number two. Well, you can, you know, I've done something on power of worship on that one. You can go look for that. Positive expectation. You know, a lot of times, if you don't let it be part and parcel of your life, it's your choice. I've, I've, I've read the Bible and you know what? I can find in that book where it says, have a negative expectation in life. Did you hear me? I can't find it. Even when people sinned in the Bible and they repented in the Bible, God changed his mind and or not they repent. So I can't find where it says I should have a negative expectation. So I decide to have a positive one. So when I pray, I expect answers. When I speak to a mountain, I expect the mountain to go. And it's because I want the word of God to govern my life. Say amen. If you can find it later in the Bible, come and show me, but I haven't found it, where he says, have a negative expectation about your future. You know? You know what I found out? Even the ones that were retired in the Bible, the Lord showed them how they should die. Did you hear me? So if he hasn't showed you, don't die anyhow. <laughs> say loud, amen. So have a positive expectation. It says, if you shall say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and shall not what? Doubt, not in the mind, but in the heart. That those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever. Therefore, when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall. Well, I can't find anywhere. I checked Jesus' life. I checked. Even Jesus, he said, I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it back. When they wanted to take him, somebody drew out his sword. He said, I can ask my father. I will send a legion of angels. So I didn't see any, well, to the slaughter I come. Poor old me. I don't know what will happen to me in the future. Well, if it's God's will for me to die, I will die like, I didn't, I didn't see that. Have you seen that one in your own Bible? In case you have, you have been reading the wrong one. Say amen. So have a positive expectation. Number three, James chapter one. Let's go to James chapter one. Faith in the word. He said, but is that not all faith related? No, it's not just like that. Faith in the word. I like this one. It says from verse 21, James 1. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Where is that found? In your soul. And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to do what? Save your souls. But be doers. Be doers of the word. And not hearers only. Do you what? Deceive. So who is the greatest deceiver of you now? For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, 
He's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he is. But he who looks for the perfect law of liberty and continues in is not forgetful here, but they do of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. Say amen. amen. Faith in the word. Being a doer. It's another decision you've got to make. I, I mean, anybody can do anything they want to do, but you make up your mind to do what the word says. Amen. It's as simple as that. Do it. What does the Bible say? Do it. Don't say, read the Bible, analyze it, ask yourself if you really want to do it, then consider maybe you should do it. No, you didn't say that. Do it. Say amen. If you find it there, do it. You get the gist? Being a doer of the word. One of the things you can find in the word, forgiveness. Say Amen. Mark 11, 23, this is another point. You should walk in forgiveness. Somebody offends you. Don't wait for them to come and ask for your forgiveness. Forgive. Don't say, when you come and ask for my forgiveness, then I will forgive you. But until then, I will hold it against you. You don't understand the Bible. In that Mark 11 we saw, it says, when you stand praying, forgive. Why? It's going to block your flow with God if you don't forgive. And let me tell you this, those of you who have parents that maybe did things wrong to you and you hold it against them, shall I give you the secret why you should forgive them? Whatever you retain is retained in you. Did you hear me? Whatever you retain is retained where? So if a boy was maltreated by his father and he does not forgive his father, guess what? When he has his own child, he will do exactly what his father did to him, to his own child. Why? He did not release his father. He retained that offense. He will carry it on to his own future. So in your own best interest, forgive. Did you hear me? It's called selfish interest. Forgive. If somebody wants to destroy your testimony, destroy your reputation, make you look like the worst thing that ever happened since sliced bread, forgive. Hard, eh? I have forgiven people shedding tears before. Lord, you mean I should forgive this person? Yeah. I don't want to forgive. They forgive. But Lord, forgive. Well, how can this person do this to me? Forgive. Oh, God, please. Listen, guys, if there's one thing that you must be a specialist in, is in forgiveness. Release. Because another word for forgive is release. People will do things against you. Sometimes when people listen to me talk like this, you think maybe I don't have problems. Or I don't have relatives that are in bad shape. <laughs> or I don't have any, you know, I'm just... I'm untouchable and immovable and no, 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 no. I heard deeply in many parts. Am I talking here? I have, I have seen my own brother, half-brother die of sickness and disease when we're not born again. I've seen things happen. I grew up in the roughest of the roughest. So I know the pain. That's why you see a hardness to hold on to the word of God. Because I know the alternative is no good. <laughs> those of you alternatively for you have other things you can follow on I don't have it's one way Jesus Christ he's my only salvation I don't know of any other one so there is a tenacity with this uh, when I look around me oh no I don't want no, that I don't want what he has for me <laughs> say Lord amen those of you who have a lot of good things around you I say well what if I really don't like to forgive him I have no choice because if I don't forgive, what happened to them will happen to you. And I don't want. No, if you want, stay. You don't want to forgive, that's all right. I mean, in ministry, people have messed us up so badly, you will wonder what you did wrong. The persons that we invested the most in, we shared our hearts with, we exposed our, our weaknesses to us. Thank God we were not sinful weaknesses. I'm not talking about this country, so don't start saying I know who he's talking about. Look at your mind. <laughs> I mean, when this person left church and began to talk about us, 
Oh my God. And so I went to God. I said, do you still want us to forgive this? <laughs> he said, yes. And you know what I found out? Every time we had forgiven and released people, the kingdom of God increased in our lives. I can't explain it. Every time we've had, it's as if when God is about to promote you, a major catastrophe will land. So you have an opportunity to be offended so you will never make that progress. Learn the secret now. Forgive. I can't explain it. Whether it's financial in ministry, whether it's open doors in ministry, everything happened just after one major problem. The problem comes as if Satan is ready to finish us completely. And then we look at that situation and navigate our way around it and forgive the person. And then the next thing we see, bam, bam, bam. I'm like, what did I do differently? Nothing. You didn't allow that offense to hold you down. You got promoted in God. That's why I said reprogramming for kingdom breakthroughs. Not just breakthroughs, but kingdom Am I making sense here? I don't know about you, but this has been our story. Another thing you must learn, this is part of the uh, obedience, casting your cares on the Lord. That's one of the latest things I learned in the last couple of years. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Philippians 4, 6 says, be careful for nothing. But in what? I'd like you to read it with me. But in what? everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God and the peace of God hallelujah you know what I found out cast your cares Ooh, that's hard just like forgiveness <laughs> it looks unnatural to cast your cares on the Lord first Peter 5 says the same thing casting all of your cares upon him for he what cares for you. So I have to stay in that place of casting my cares. What's the care? An anxiety. In the Greek it's merima or merima now or something. Anxiety. Something that will cause you to, it will break your focus if you learn to if you dwell on it. It will affect your mind. No. Take it down. Give it to the Lord. Why? So that you can be free to hear instructions from him and be free to obey him. Did you hear me? You can be free to deny, to, to bind the devil too. This is how it works. I give the example very easily. I've done this in this church before. I speak offensively about Tony. No, let me still use Marco. <laughs> and some of you sympathizers will meet Marco later and say, Marco, I know you're offended the way pastor was talking about you, but it's all right. Busybody. You know, my wife calls it steadying the ark ministries. <laughs> oh, no, no. How does she put it? Fig leaf ministries. Go and cover him. Oh, don't be offended, Marco. No. Watch. If I said anything offensive about Marco, what will, it, what will hurt Marco the most? It's not necessarily what I said, but the fact that I said it publicly. Is it true? Because his reputation will be at stake. So Marco will feel justified to be offended. Watch. If that did happen, Marco will not receive anything spiritual from what I'm saying again. And those of you sympathizers will follow him. Everything else I say, you, something you just rises up like, I wouldn't say that about another person. Is it because he has a privilege of the microphone? Why is he talking to my Marco like that? And all that offense is inside you. Watch. You close the door to your own spiritual progress. Yeah. Marco closes the door to his spiritual progress. He leaves that hall that day feeling very justified. So when they say, how was the service today? I don't want to say anything. Marco's wife will say, Marco, you didn't look like, you were a jolly, jolly guy. So what's going on? Did your wife come today? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Just check in. <laughs> you, know, you know, so the drama will continue. If Marco does not know what I'm talking about now, that could be the beginning of the ceiling of the growth of Marco's spiritual life. And you know what? In life, when you're not making progress, you start deteriorating. Many people are in that situation. What should Marco do? What is it that has offended me? 
If I am wrong, that's my problem, not yours. Marco should take, I said, Lord, I cast the cares of my reputation on you. And I roll it away. So Marco's reputation is now in the hands of God. If any of you thought what I said were reducing Marco's reputation, it's up to the Lord to correct his reputation in your mind. But Marco is now free to obey God. He casts his cares. Are you seeing my point? He casts that care so he can freely forgive me. Even though I didn't ask. But for his own sanity and his own sake and his own spiritual progress, he needs to forgive me by casting the care and walk away from there. And say, Pastor, that was a good message. And be real, not fake. And you walk away from that. Marco's spiritual life will continue to grow. God will now get on my case. Who do you think you are to talk to my son Marco? You see what he has done? He has given the care to God. God is now dealing with me. If he didn't give the care to God, God wouldn't deal with me. He will be offended. God will not deal with me. When I now want to go into fellowship with God, I say, Father, I love you. I thank you. I will just notice a silence in heaven. Father, 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 silence. Oh God of heaven, silence. Some of you don't even know when there's a silence, so you just continue. <laughs> you don't know when there's a silence, just continue. Oh, chandele, chandele, chandele. Well, Father, what's going on? He says, you have spoken words of pride. You've hurt somebody. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. My own relationship with God gets intact. Marco smartly cast his cares on the Lord if he did. Life goes on. That offense has been denied of the ability to stop our spiritual progress. You get the gist? So how many of you think you need some praying today? Oh dear Lord. Even your neighbor that allowed their God dog to stray into your compound and they poo pooed around. You're still holding your offense against them. <laughs> Till now. And you are born again. You wonder why you can't tell them the gospel. <laughs> oh, God help me. Do you know that if you don't deal with these offenses, they go there and they get stored up. Am I talking here? You read the Bible. If you're in this position right now, you read the Bible, it's dry. What I'm saying to you is just amusing you. No insight. You are in trouble. When we finish this prayer, repent. Did you hear me? Yeah. Repent. So that the clog in your heart I'm not talking your physical heart now. Your spiritual life can be removed so that there can be a flow from heaven. Say loud amen. amen. Number six, check your motives and your focus regularly. We've talked about that a lot. When Jesus was talking about giving, praying, and fasting, he was looking at motives. And the last point, have constant communion with God. Mm. I don't want to dwell too much on this because of time. Have what? Some of you don't even know. You have no clue what that means. You think it's a religious, thou art my father, our father who art in heaven. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I will say our father seven times, then I'm communing with God. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about face-to-face -face relationship. That's why I can know when there's silence in heaven. Did you hear what I just said? When I'm trying to commune with God, there's silence. Why? Because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They are acquainted with my voice. Why? Because of constant communion. So you need to develop what? Constant communion with God. If you've taken in all the things I've said and you now go to God, don't put on any airs. Did you hear me? Whereas in the, for, in the former point I made, we're not supposed to be criticizing one another. We're not supposed to be fault finding with one another. But if you know you have a fault, where do you think is the best place to discuss it? In the presence of God. So you come with that. Don't come. The Bible says you come boldly to the throne of grace. He said we have a high priest that is touched with the feeling of infirmity. He said we should come with the full assurance of faith. Hallelujah. Don't go in there with this, oh, God, I don't know. I'm, I know I'm not holy enough. Shut up. He knows. He's not accepting you to come in his presence because of your holiness. He's coming to you. You are coming to his presence because of the finished work of Calvary. Amen. Hallelujah. And you should take advantage of that. You know how I come in this presence? I just sense things. You know, I, Lord, I've not been having that kind of breakthrough with you. What's going on? Is there anything I said or did, you know? Show me, show me, show me. Shows me I repent of it. Bam. Flow. Amen. But in my communion, it's straight talk. Thank you, Lord, for today. Uh, you know, that was a powerful time you gave us, Lord. This is how I talk to God. 
I'm talking to him like a friend. Ah, this is a powerful time you get. Now, you're, you know, the other time you were saying something. What's on your mind? Communion. Did you notice it's not religious? Uh, um, Father, thou art my God. Don't thou art me. <laughs> Don't thou art anybody here. Father God. Amen. It says, come boldly. Remember, say boldly. boldly. Come boldly to the throne of grace. You are already accepted in the beloved. You are already welcome. You don't need to pray through to get to God. When you pray through, you're praying through problems, you're praying through circumstances, you're praying through barriers. You're not praying through where God is concerned. You're going to God is on the basis, Father God. And let me give you this clue. I have a relationship with him. He can tell me whatever he wants. Say amen. How many of you have friends that there are some things you can't tell them? You have friends like that. You should look at them and say, ah, this guy's not ready to hear that. Some of you are like that with God. God can't tell you some things. You know why? You are on one frequency. You know if your radio receiver is on one frequency, you only hear from that channel. Some of you are on the frequency, God loves me, 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 God loves me. So if you want to say, you are wrong here, no, God loves me. If you want to say, but stop talking rubbish, no, God loves me. You are on one frequency. So God can't talk to you on any other frequency. So what do you do? Change the frequency. God, if there's any area of my life you think I need correction, feel free. And you would think he would count ten. No, he won't give you one. And that one is the key to every other one. <laughs> one thing thou lackest. Just one. Don't be afraid. Go to God in that confidence. Lord, I love you. I remember this is one, one I can never forget. Every time God has dealt with us like that, I remember when we first came into the country, we were staying in Diana's house and we looked at the rent and everything of the house we're going to move into. I went to my closet. I said, God, you know what? I don't know about you, but I don't have enough money to pay the rent. <laughs> so how do you figure that we can solve this problem, you know? You know what he asked me? Do you love me enough to obey me? He didn't tell me how the money will come. He just said, do you love me enough to obey me? You know what he was saying? Don't let survival be your motivation. Let my love be your motivation. I said, Lord, you know I love you. He said, if you love me and you want to obey me, leave that in my hands. Whoa. And I've left it since then till now. And he's still coming through. Ain't going on retirement yet. How can you go on retirement and have me as a son? Are you kidding? <laughs> Are you kidding? I'm busy thinking. What You said like, you can do exceeding abundantly above all I can ask or think. Oh, my God. I'm thinking jets. You know what I'm saying? You proud boy. Thank you. I'm thinking jet. It was called Jeep Jet. No, let me not tell you guys. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know what I'm saying? We're going global. I can't wait for BA all the time or KLM. Now, can you see what I'm doing here? I am thinking and he's able to do exceeding abundantly above. How about that for a trial? God, can you really do that? I'd like to see you do that. How did I come about that? He put the thought in my mind many years ago. I didn't just come up with it. I entered the plane one day and he says, one of these days you have a plane. Get it behind me, Satan. <laughs> I don't want no plane. Next time I entered, what about what I told you the last time? What do I need a plane for? Your calling is to the nations. You will need one soon. Start believing me. Oh, God, you are something else. I'm still struggling with the church in Kano. We've not even had 100 people. You're talking plane here. What's your problem? Can't you see? <laughs> <laughs> and he started sowing the seed from that time. That's why I know. It's not because I'm trying to be like whoever has a plane. I know. Now I've told you now. Some of you are going to get mad at me. <laughs> so I'm ready for your madness. <laughs> Just cast your cares on. Leave it with it. Say amen. So that's one of the things I know. I, I'm, I'm, well, you know. If it doesn't happen, will I cry? No. Will I say, oh God, I failed you? No. But it won't happen 
sorry, it wouldn't be because I didn't believe him. It would be because he chose not to make it happen. That's the difference. So I'm just sharing with you my own drama with him. So we have all these kind of crazy dramas. If I tell you some things, you think I'm mad. That's the truth. And sometimes I think so too. <laughs> sometimes I think, you know, I think you need to walk away is it in the word and I'll show myself it's there. But do you think, I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's God. He can do what he wants. Say amen. How many of you think you need to pray today? Okay. The least you can do is to ask God to give you grace to have constant communion with him. Do you know I can finish a message like this and I will get to my close at the next day and God will tell me, you were wrong the way you spoke to my people. And I'm busy repenting. I remember one time it happened, I came to the service Wednesday that followed. I told the church there, I said, this is, they didn't even notice I said anything wrong. They did not notice I said anything wrong. He noticed and he gave it to me in my closet. It is not just one-sided. It's not about money. It's not about, it's about correction too. It's about showing you the process you are going through. It's about opening your, his perspective to you in the things you are going through so he can help you to move on with him. Have you received something today? Yes. I thought I should put that, t- well, I didn't plan to put the jet one there, but it came out. So those of you who are offended, forgive me for saying it. Those of you who are not offended, join your faith with mine. And those who are offended, just forget that I said it because I didn't, ma- I didn't plan. When I was planning the message, I didn't know it was going to come out. <laughs> but it is well. Amen. Let's bow our heads to pray. I want you to talk to God today. I don't know who has offended you. I don't know what you have held against anybody. Maybe there have been so much there in your heart that you have even forgotten that they were there. Ask God to remind you so you can remove all the clog and the wheel of progress. Mm-hmm.